Yeah, fighters, what's going on, y'all? Before we jump into this awesome podcast with performance coach Phil DeRue, I just wanted to say that this podcast and every podcast is brought to you by the Life of a Fighter shop. You can go to lifeofafighter.com forward slash shop and check out all the awesome products and services that we have. Two most popular right now are our Fitness and Nutrition Vault as well as our Pro Coach program. All right, now that we got that out of the way, before we jump into the episode, I also wanted to say, again, one more thanks to Phil for taking the time to jump on the podcast. This was a little last minute and impromptu. And you guys can check out not only everything that Phil has going on for his programs, content, community, all that great stuff at derustrong.com. You can see all the info below. But you can also see his latest jujitsu tutorial on bjjfanatics.com. Again, the link will be below. And again, if you guys have any questions or anything like that on what we've covered or anything along those lines, you can reach out to me. Also, you can reach out to Phil. Again, his social media will be below. And I hope you guys enjoy. Without further ado, let's jump on into it. What's going on, y'all? Another episode of the Life of a Fighter podcast. We're joined by special guest and renowned performance coach, Phil DeRue. Phil, I appreciate you taking the time, man. How are you holding up? I'm doing good, man. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. It's kind of like an impromptu. Um, I, I appreciate you kind of jumping on it last minute because I know I, I posted something on my story. You just kind of hit me up. And I honestly, I appreciate all the content and everything that you put out. And even though, like, obviously performance coaches and all that, I don't really look at it as competition. I think that when you are providing enough value to people, um, you can kind of shout out other people. And actually, I want the fighters that are listening right now and the people that are listening to actually – go out and check out not just your body armor series, but all the shit you have going on. I think it's awesome. Um, and we're actually talking before you mentioned you got BJJ Fanatic who put out a series and a tutorial series. So I wanted to just kind of drop that real quick too, before we jump into everything else. Yeah, man, for sure. Um, I appreciate that too, by the way. Um, yeah. So I just recently put out a body weight only program called body armor. It's an eight week program. I mean, it's specifically for mixed martial arts, but the average person can get in shape with it as well. I have a lot of my fighters actually doing it right now because they don't have access to a gym. Um, And basically what we're doing is it's a conjugated style of an approach, um, but the intensities are going to change based off of the tempo and based off of the maximally radiation or isometric contraction that you're going to be putting into it. Uh, the great thing about it is also that it hits the body as its entirety, so it's a global workout. Um, you work on your conditioning, you're working on strength endurance, you're working on even hypertrophy in some ways, and also coordination, which is going to be key once, you know, all this thing blows over and you can get back into the weight room and really put on more more overall absolute strength. Um, the, the other program, or the, I should say the tutorial video series that I put out with BJJ Fanatics, you can find that out on their website, bjjfanatics.com. It's called Rolling Strong. I go through about, I want to say roughly 20 to 30 special exercises that a grappler, BJJ practitioner, a wrestler can all do to increase their performance, you know, on the mats or in the cage. So that's put out, that was put out yesterday, um, but I'm excited about that one because I do show a lot of great exercises on there that, that can enhance overall performance for sure. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm excited to, to check that out myself, actually. And the links and everything is going to be below for you guys, so if you want to check that out. And to your point, man, I just wanted to kind of tag this in is um, even just the YouTube series, or I'm sorry, that your video that you put out for that MMA body weight, I actually sent it to a few of my clients that I still virtually coach. And a few of them, actually, that aren't even fighters, I thought it would be a good change of pace for them. And mm-hmm. I've been hearing some amazing things back. They're like, this is exactly what I'm looking for. This has been amazing. I love it. So highly recommend, even if you guys aren't competing or fighting in that genre, I think there's tremendous value in these movements and in what's happening to work into your program, especially with the little equipment we may or may not have. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, that's great, man. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, like I said, I just appreciate what you're doing and, and kind of how you're putting it out there. And there's so many different things that we could talk about, but I kind of wanted to keep it around this core idea, especially with everything that's going on with coronavirus and being stuck at home and, and all those various body weighted movements. One of the things I thought was great about um, your kind of approach and the concepts that you have is, like you said, total body, but from a global set or, or global outlook of multi planes and moving through different variations um, and also being able to recruit muscle fibers and not just from the 
the physical side, but from the neurological side, I thought there's tremendous value in there too. So I was just curious to kind of get your thoughts on, you know, we're not getting to the nitty gritty specifically, but the things and, and when we're limited with equipment, how, like you said, you're having your fighters work through this. What are some of the really key things you're working on to make sure when they do come back to the gym, they're coming back on point? Well, to maintain overall work capacity is going to be key because that'll help us go into the specificity once we get closer to a fight, if, you know, whenever we start to have fights back put on. Um, so primarily right now, uh, we want to make sure that we're working on our explosive power through ballistics and plyometrics, and then also working on our structural integrity and strength endurance work with slow eccentrics and tempo methods um, to enhance, again, that time under tension feel so that they can at least maintain some muscle mass and then also work into those, those lactic buffering capacity sessions too as well. The conditioning also, on the other hand, is we, we do like to throw in or I have thrown in a lactic capacity and aerobic power work, and that's primarily going to help with the ability to repeat bouts of energy for a long duration and then the aerobic power is working on the higher echelon of that, of that aerobic zone um, to increase mitochondrial density and also increase just overall capacity to take in and utilize oxygen. Bingo. And, and with saying that, that's something that um, I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, being limited, I'm going to say limited for maybe lack of a better term, but limited with the options that we may or may not have, did you find it challenging to be able to implement some of those movements that also can incorporate all the things that you're trying to touch on? Does um, that make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it took me, it didn't really take me that long. Like, I really just sat down. It took me, a, like, about an hour and a half to really just sit down and go over all the details on what I wanted to do, you know, from a step-by-step -step approach, the basic objective of the program in general. Um, but <clears throat> what, I, what I thought was, would be the best way to stimulate or intensify the movements is to increase the time under tension and increase, um, well, I should say, change the pattern of movements, whether it be unilateral movements, whether it be bilateral movements. The goal really is to make sure that they're getting maximal intensity through failure sets. And I thought that that would be a better correlation to increase the intensity, increase the hypertrophy, increase the strength endurance through those means. Um, and as far as mobility goes you know we're actually working through again all joint capsules and making sure that we gain that capillary space so that we can perform well once the time comes to actually put more load on our body when we have you know the ability to do so so I, the goal really of this whole thing was to at least if not anything if somebody who is not in shape at all this is going to give them the greatest base so that they can grow from it and the ones that are already in shape, this is going to help at least maintain as much strength and power production as they can um, for the time being. So that's primarily the basis behind it. Yeah, and I think that was a great point, especially when you talk about, you know, your time under tensions and also the structural integrity of the body. Um, you know, it kind of leads me to we had a bunch of questions people were shooting in, and I kind of wanted to work them in where I thought they were appropriate. And this kind of makes me think of one of uh, talking about some bad habits potentially that you see fighters coming in with or some things that you have to overcome, whether it's because of years of maybe just sport specific training that hasn't really incorporated finding structural balance and integrity to their body or maybe any variations of that. Yeah, so I mean, first and foremost, we have to make sure that the joints have the capacity to do the demands placed upon it. So for the most part, what I see is a lot of hypotic drawn in postures, you know, anterior pelvic tilt type, type deals. And um, from there, you know, that kind of puts us in a bind or it limits us from an exercise selection standpoint, because again, we can't load dysfunction. So increasing joint range of motion active end range control in each joint capsule is first and foremost, in my opinion. Um, with that being said, another major thing that I see is that these guys want to overwork themselves in a sport specific exercise. And what I basically mean is that they would rather do something on the bag or something that mimics the sport play. Um, as opposed to actually getting generally strong and working through base positions and planes of motion. And what I have to reiterate to them is that if we can increase their general physical preparedness, that's going to enhance their specific capabilities, not the other way around. So the goal for me, again, is to kind of re-engineer their thought process by 
making sure that they see it from a data standpoint, whether we increase numbers, you know, in the weight room or just showing them how they can increase their overall range of motion and full functionality that will transfer over onto the mats when the time comes. A hundred percent. I'm, I'm going to backtrack really quick. Cause I feel like a lot of people may hear like kyphotic and anterior pelvic tilt and be like, well, what the hell are you talking about? So two things. Um, one, we're going to have like a video version of this. So I'll have some nice visual cues so you guys can check that out. And also when you think kyphotic, think of like, especially for that upper body, we're thinking into that forward shape, like a real traditional tie fighter, how they're having their shoulders rounded. Um, and then from the anterior pelvic tilt, tell me if this makes sense. So, but I always think like Kim Kardashian from the, you know, the ass sticking out, the, the hips kind of tilted forward. Um, yeah, yeah. Yep. That, that's it. just to get a visual cue for you guys that are listening and may not 100% get that. That's typically what, what, what you kind of thinking of when that happens. And mm -hmm. you mentioned some great points, especially having to overcome that and defeat that mindset. And it's funny, I was talking to someone earlier and they're talking about sometimes wanting to know from an auxiliary exercise standpoint, maybe there's some sports specific movements that um, can be incorporated in one way, shape, or form. And one that I saw Tony Ricci that maybe we wouldn't necessarily call just an auxiliary, but it's a, a grip strength row or, or a kind of yep. staggered stance with that grip row. And, and those are some of the things that I think are beautiful between what Tony does or the likes of Tony yourself and how that incorporates, but not just saying, hey, I'm going to throw, I don't know, 100 kicks in this workout. And, and instead, we can work on some other variations of movement for that GPP or other forms of performance. So long way of asking, what are some of your favorite ways to incorporate some of those sport specific movements for sure. But yeah. in, in an actual exercise way. Yeah, and, and we're basically, when, when you're talking about that, what Tony does a lot really well is that he uses general movements to enhance specific adaptations. So it's general specific in nature. Um, I use that row variation. It's actually in Rolling Strong, that variation. So if you guys want to check that out. Um, but some things like good morning, search your good morning, split stance, search your good morning, a lot of actually good morning variations are key, especially when you're talking about grappling. Um, when you're talking about just general movement from, from a plyometric standpoint, I do like to do a lot of lateral bounds or skater bounds. That's going to help the lateral force displacement to help a fighter get in and out of the pocket. You know, um, again, uh, like a landmine press, something in that 45 degree axis, because again, a lot of the guys can't get into full shoulder flexion. So that 45 degree angle helps with displacing the force appropriately that can enhance overall punching power. So those are some of the key ones that I like to utilize for sure. Yeah, I think that's beautiful right there. Just for everybody listening, like understand how valuable that is to so take a second, really like digest that. And also, again, I think it's great that it's worked into all your other systems and programs. And that kind of, there was another really interesting question. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, we talk about the conjugate method. And a lot of times people should be or hopefully are familiar, but a lot of times some people aren't. And how we can apply max effort days, dynamic effort days, and then also looking at different styles of training and different ways to incorporate, whether it's, you know, your trachasic programming and, and working in different styles there. So I was just wondering how you took and, and how you see the conjugate method incorporate all these other styles and how you made it your own without obviously getting too far into, you know, the woods on that. that yeah, sense. sure. Yeah. So I, I know that a lot of people have been asking, like, how do I implement triphasic in with a condensed conjugate method? Now, the reason why I decided to utilize triphasic was for a basic GPP approach. So general physical preparedness is going to appropriately get the body, the physiology ready for the work at hand inside the camp. And once we start camp, then we do more of that conjugate style of an approach. So it's triphasic first, which is two weeks of eccentrics, two weeks of isometrics, and then the two weeks that we go into the concentrics, that's when we usually start our condensed conjugate. Again, because for me, I only have roughly two to three days to work with my fighters because of all the other skills training that's going on. So I had to condense the two days or the four days into two days of dynamic effort and max effort, and then we did our repetition effort with the accessory work. You know, the basic three methods of strength training is going to be maximal effort, dynamic effort, and repetition effort. And the goal really is to increase force, increase acceleration, and from there you, you can obviously produce maximum amount of power and other, other means of performance benefits. So with the triphasic, I put that in just for basic joint integrity, tissue remodeling, hypertrophy if they needed it, and also coordination of each what we call tester lifts, which is a compound lift that I utilize to help 
show me exactly how well they are taking to the program, how strong are they getting, and how well this is going to fully correlate over to the ring or to the cage. Thank you. And that actually makes me think of a question in line with that. Of I'm thinking of a few people just personally that I know off the top of my head. Sometimes I feel like fighters, A, they'll do a great job taking care of themselves outside of camp, but there's a lot of fighters that don't, and they use camp as a window sometimes to actually get in shape. So yeah. I'm curious to see when, when you have fighters coming in and you're like, okay, I'm going to use my triphasic to prep, and then I'm in camp, I'm going to switch gears. Have you had to back off the conjugate method to stay in that triphasic pattern because they're so far okay. off from where they should be? Does that make sense? Um, not so much because what a lot of people don't understand with conjugate is that it's constant variation, constant tempo changes, and constant mm-hmm. volume changes. And it doesn't just have to be about the dynamic effort or max effort. What you can do is just work general physical preparedness and just basically bury the movements at hand that are going to increase that general work capacity. So that's it. those are things like sled drags and, mm-hmm. and we have a belt squat here, so we'll do belt squat marching, you know, things of that nature that's very general but can increase strength endurance and, and increase the overall stability of each joint. So, again, there's ways to do it. Um, if, if a fighter really, and I, and I see this a lot, a lot of these guys have to take fights on short notice, and some of them are coming in with not the greatest amount of overall fitness um, from a controlled environment at least. They, they may be technically sound. They may have the ability to spar pretty efficiently because, let's face it, they're efficient in their skills. But they lack the controlled fitness um, to do the work and recover from the work, which is the main priority. So, yeah, for the most part, if they, if we have time to do that four weeks of triphasics with the two weeks being going into, con- you know, the condensed conjugate, um, we do that. If not, if I know that this guy may or a girl may have to take a fight in two to three weeks notice, then we just basically work on keeping it in a range that will allow them to gain that solid foundation of work and also the efficiency of movement. So working around the fives range, you know, 80, 85% range, things like that um, with compound movements that are going to one enhance strength, enhance neuromuscular coordination and you know, the coordination for the muscles to understand how to move underneath load. And also, again, increase their strength, endurance, and other means of power production. Now, if they don't have the optimal amount of strength, obviously we can't produce the maximum amount of power. So the goal really is to make sure that they have, one, the strength to, you know, produce that that force at a higher rate. So we usually do that first and then go into the power. And hopefully we have enough time to get that solid stimulus and maintain that adaptation to peak for the fight. Got it. Yeah. And that kind of makes me want to jump into a a question kind of in this ballpark of, you know, a lot of times, especially in fighters, you've got to work around injuries and you have to program around that to make it happen to show up for a fight day. And a question that came in was what was, or what do you find the hardest injury to have to work around while staying in camp and having them have to show up for a fight day? Well, I mean, it really just depends on the situation. It depends on the athlete and what their strengths are. Like, obviously, if we, yeah, their style is going to play a major role. Like, if they have hip issues and they're a wrestler and they need to use their hips a lot, that's going to be obviously something that we need to work around, but it's going to be very hard to dictate the, the training progression and also see exactly how well they're going to be prepared for the fight because they're, they're missing a huge component of their game. So, you know, I've had to work around, you know, ACL injuries, hip injuries, hip, you know, hip replacement injuries, matter of fact, shoulder impingements, um, flat tears, uh, obviously bulging discs, there's a huge amount of things there. And obviously your, your, your average is bumps and bruises, you know, uh, turf toe. There's a bunch of different things I had to work around. And we just find a way to at least load the body in a, in a manageable fashion to increase the stimulus or get the stimulus needed to increase the adaptation. And that may just be something as simple as isometrics and maximal isometrics into, or let's say, a, you know, like an immovable object. So, you know, so an overcoming isometric that, again, it's not going to put the body at risk for a further injury, but it's going to enhance those qualities that we need to to get the body stronger. One, to mitigate further injury, but also not, 
aid on to the problem. A hundred percent. And and I think that's, that's a great way of actually, I, I appreciate how you put it too. It, it depends on the style, it depends on circumstances. And I feel like so much of, with a lot of these questions coming, it's all, it depends, right? There's so yeah. much to the variables of, that have to be considered in circumstances. Um, but I thought that was a really fun one. We're actually starting to get a little bit close to the end of where we, we like to cut it of, you know, uh, the most dynamic or I guess impressive athlete that you've kind of seen and been able to work with that really just made you stand back and say, wow, in the gym. It, it, again, I don't want to, you know, have to necessarily throw anyone under the bus or, or highlight another person if you don't feel comfortable with that, but I figured that was a fun question. Yeah, so I give you two. We have one um, by the name, a guy by the name of Walt Harris. Um, he's a oh, US yeah. heavyweight, um, phenomenal athlete, played college basketball, um, I seen this man, he weighs about, I think he was weighing about 265 and with a one step jumped on a 62 inch box, which was incredible to see. Um, a man at his size actually doing that was, was awesome. Um, and another one, Will Brooks was a Bellator champion. Um, another great, one of, one of the best fighter athletes I've ever had in the gym, um, I've seen him do things or I try to make him do things that I think that people cannot do. And he just makes me look like a fool sometimes. <laughs> so it's always fun when you have an athlete that's able or capable of doing these crazy multidirectional plyometric drills um, and make it look effortless and make it look like what you want it to look like. You know, there's sometimes where I'm like, that's not like I, I see fighters and they, and they do things and I'm like, it's not really how I envisioned it, <laughs> but with Will, everything that I envisioned it to go, the way to go, he did it. So it was, it was good to see that. But, yeah, those are those are the two. And then Tiago Moises is another UFC fighter. Um, he actually deadlifted. It was at a body weight of 170 pounds. I think I'm actually it was 165. He deadlifted 505 sumo with no with no no straps. Just raw. No no chalk, Damn. no belt, and just pulled it <laughs> on a stiff bar. So, <laughs> gotta appreciate that, man. I don't even know if, if everyone listening can truly appreciate that, but that's fucking awesome. Um, and then well, I had one real, like, last fun one, especially like with everything going on, all the athletes you have to take care of. As an athlete yourself, and as someone that's very active, you know, how, how's your knee feeling? This was a question I heard a lot. How are you dealing with all that? You put out some great content on how you're personally staying active and taking care of yourself, especially having to postpone surgery. So I just wanted to take, you know, finish up with how's that knee feeling? How are you working around that? And kind of leave it there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it, it sucks that I have to prolong this, you know, this, this whole thing, but at the end of the day, I'm just going to work on getting stronger, improving my stability, you know, um, working through isometrics, working through the sagittal plane, you know, obviously I'm not going to do any type of high, high impact or rotational work, or lateral displacement, unless it's like spreading the floor apart for a sagittal plane movement. But for the most part, I'm still, I, my knee feels fine. It feels stable for the most part. You know, I've been, I've been doing, I've been doing a conjugate style and approach. I'm um, still doing my max effort, still doing on that dynamic effort. I'm just, obviously I'm not doing any type of uh, plyometric drills, but I mean, I am to a degree, I'm just not leaving the floor. So I'm doing more of a, more of a reactive strength type work where I use a band and kettlebell swings for that, that, you know, that overstretch and they, uh, the overspeed eccentric. So, I mean, it, it, it's working pretty well for me right now. I'm just trying to get stronger in that knee, you know, and increase overall force production throughout my lower body. And then everything else, like the bench and everything, I just need to bring up just in general, because eventually I, after this is all said and done, I want to get back into competing and do another meet here pretty soon. So hopefully with all things, you know, situated the right way. And once all this craziness stops, then I can start to get into competition mode. A hundred percent, man. I also want to kind of like wrap it up with not only are you coaching for obviously athletes and fighters, and you also have virtual coaching options and you have these great contents you put out, but also you have a mentorship program. So I kind of wanted to also put that out there and, and kind of give you the platform for that for a second. Speak to that. Is that still something you're taking people on for, um, uh -huh. and how, how, how's that right now? Yeah, um, as of right now, we have over 300 members, 300 well-qualified well coaches um, in, in, the member, in the mentorship pro course. The course really is basically just an overview of everything that I've done in my past 12 years of coaching. I'm giving you all my protocols, all my methodology.
strategies. I'm breaking things down. Um, we do a weekly call, um, a Q and A session with me with everybody who joins the call, and then uh, and then they'll get access to me or, you know from a from a from a messaging standpoint if they have any questions there too as well, and other programs too. So so it's a good it's a good it's a good environment of coaches that are willing to learn and get better, and we all help each other out. So. It, you know, again, I give them as much as I possibly can in that mentorship with all the things that you see on Instagram and YouTube. Um, I go into deep detail on why it's important and how we can actually utilize it for our athletes. Yeah, and, and speaking from my own experience, I'm going to a seminar that both yourself and, and uh, Tony Ricci put on with the Fight Science Institute. The way that you put things out there and the way you break it down is uh, tremendous in value and also just being able to apply it to it. It really kind of carries both ways. I feel like sometimes people go from the academic and educational side of things, but miss out on the application to the real world or vice versa. Um, and I appreciate how you kind of marry the two together. So I just wanted to kind of share that. And I highly recommend the coaches that are listening as well, take advantage of this mentorship program. It's not often that you have someone to your level that you can able to actually pick their brain and dive into it. So I highly recommend taking advantage of that. Oh, thanks, brother. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course, man. I appreciate what you do and how you put it out there. And, um, yeah, we're kind of coming to the end. So I wanted to leave the platform to you for a second, you know, final messages, things to put out there, and, and just say thanks, too, for taking the time. Uh, no worries, man. For all the coaches out there, all the athletes out there, just stay patient, man. Keep keep progressing no matter what the situation. We'll get over this. We'll be stronger, be smarter, and uh, hopefully, uh, again, this won't last as long. So let's do it. Beautiful. Thank you again. And again, guys, check the details below. We got Phil social media, YouTube. If you're not already on that, get on that. There's just value in that alone more than you'll find in a lot of paid programs. So um, highly recommend that. And like I said, man, thanks. I always appreciate it. Uh, no worries, bro.